You're listening to the Artistic Finance Podcast, Show 70. On today's show, I interview Lisa Paniccia about her book, The ABCs for Financial Independence. We discuss fundamental habits to become financially independent and tools you can use on your path to financial independence. I also start the show talking about Broadway's 2020 Tony Awards, held last night at the Winter Garden Theater in New York City. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Today's show isn't specifically geared to artists, other than the fact that solid financial advice is as valuable to artists as to everyone. So let me take a few minutes to talk about Broadway's 2020 Tony Awards. First off, they were held on occupied Lanny Lenape land in Manhattan, the same land this podcast is recorded on. Second, this year's awards are historic because for the first time since their creation in 1947, they were delayed by a year. Now, Broadway itself has closed over the years, including a labor strike in 1975 and the September 11th attacks in 2001, but the Tony Awards have always gone on. So now let's discuss the awards. Most people care about best play, musical, best actor, etc. I care about best lighting, sound, scenic, and costume designs. Best lighting design went to Justin Townsend for Moulin Rouge and Hugh Vanstone for A Christmas Carol. Best sound design went to Peter Holinsky for Moulin Rouge and Simon Baker for A Christmas Carol. Best Scenic Design went to Derek McLean for Moulin Rouge and Rob Howe for A Christmas Carol. Best Costume Design went to Kathy Zuber for Moulin Rouge and Rob Howe for A Christmas Carol. And one more nomination I was on the lookout for this year was Best Original Score, which went to Christopher Nightingale for A Christmas Carol. Congratulations to these design teams that created wonderful looking and sounding productions. Now, if you're a super listener and have paid very close attention to all episodes of Artistic Finance, you may have picked up that our Artistic Finance producer, Nicole Steimel, and yours truly are co-producers of A Christmas Carol on Broadway. This was our first Broadway show as producers, and we are beyond thrilled that this play won in all five of the Tony Award categories it was nominated in. And it got more Tony Awards than any other play this year. To our investors that joined us for this endeavor and made it possible, thank you. Thank you for trusting us and putting your hard-earned money into a Broadway show with all the risk it entails. We hope that our future Broadway investing opportunities are able to do as well at the Tony Awards. Nicole, if you're listening to this, thank you for being willing to become a Broadway producer with me, and congratulations. And 1,000 of the biggest congratulations to the Christmas Carol design team, Hugh Vanstone, Simon Baker, Rob Howell, and Christopher Nightingale. On that high note, let's get to this week's interview. Welcome and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ethan Steimel, and today I welcome Lisa Paniccia to the podcast. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Ethan. Nice to be here. We are recording this on September 20th, 2021. The COVID-19 vaccine is mostly rolled out. Autumn officially starts in two days, and Broadway has started selling out shows with about half of all Broadway theaters actually up and running. So, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I live in Connecticut. I've lived here all my life. I am first-generation American. My parents came from Italy, and actually, with, with the name of your podcast, you know, I had been to Italy and they have some of the most beautiful architecture. So if anybody is interested in architecture, just a side note there. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in business. I used to work at the NASDAQ stock market for around 10 years, but right now I'm in a, like a whole different field. But that's kind of where I got my information and, and love of investments. And that's probably where the financial literacy grew. It's not really where it started. Um, I think it started more at home. Being first generation, I kind of had to learn everything from scratch. I think that's where the the financial literacy bug came from. And when you say everything from scratch, does that mean like about the stock market or about finance? It means everything because 
my parents were from another country. So they didn't know customs and stuff, you know, of this culture. So I had to learn about savings accounts and credit cards. The the stock market came later. So um, all of it was new. You say you're in a different field now. What is the field you're in now? I used to work for a company called Unilever. For those of you who don't know what Unilever is or does, they make a lot of consumer products like Breyer's ice cream, Hellman's mayonnaise, Dove soap. So my position got outsourced to India. And even though I'm kind of doing something similar, I'm studying for a supply chain certification. That's what I do for my day job. Okay. And what were you doing so at, at NASDAQ? NASDAQ I was in a subscriber services role. I would help brokerage firms and people who wanted to trade on NASDAQ subscribe to the service of trading on NASDAQ. Essentially, our customers or the customers that I dealt with were brokerage firms. Cool. And then wait, back to the supply chain thing. I still don't quite understand. What what does that supply chain mean? If you go to purchase something, how does it get to you? Like it's from beginning to end. It's got to be manufactured before it's even manufactured. People have have to buy um, materials to manufacture it. Then it gets manufactured. Then it gets distributed. Where does it get distributed? Um, logistics comes into play as far as warehouses. Are there warehouses across the country for this particular company that you're working at or dealing with? Who's the carrier? Is it going to be FedEx? Is it going to be a private carrier? So that the supply chain is basically getting you a product from beginning to the end customer. And your role is to analyze businesses' supply chains, or do you work somewhere in the supply chain? Working at a company, they manufacture a lot of outdoor goods like canopies and gazebos. So I work with warehouses and orders and things of that nature, but the supply chain certification is more of an expansion on that. So it'll probably open me up to to different roles. Okay, so can you describe your demographics for us? I am Caucasian. I just turned the big 5-0 this year. Congratulations. Thank you, I think. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's a good thing. It's just time really does fly and you just don't know how you got here because like you blink and and all of a sudden you're 50. <laughs> so yes, uh, East Coast girl, born and raised. So it's kind of the demographics. Your creative personality, what is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member or a piece of art that you like? I don't think this qualifies as a live event, but I do have a creative side. I crochet. I have a little Etsy site set up. And I also teach crochet, mostly pre-pandemic because it's kind of hard to do over the computer. So now onto your financial personality. Are you good or bad with money? I am good with money. Like I said, this has always kind of been like a a passion project of mine. And while I was with Unilever, that's the company who made the Dove soap and and Hellman's mayonnaise and all that, they're big on volunteering. So while I was there, I helped put together a program where our group of volunteers would go out to local high schools and give presentations on the subject. So that was a really good experience. It was just a win for everybody. The volunteers like just really loved doing this. The kids got something good out of it. The teachers enjoyed it. Obviously good for Unilever. All the way around, it was just a win. Having a conversation with them was better than giving a speech or just a straight presentation where you're talking at them. They were most excited when we we incorporated like a little prices right game. We'd incorporate a little bit of everything, be like a gallon of milk or state college versus private college tuition. Uh, a used car, pots and pans, like we just threw in a little bit of everything. That's when they got the most excited, when they were involved in the conversation. So I kind of took that little piece of knowledge, kept it in the back of my head while I was writing this book. I tried to write it in a fun and creative way. And the reason why I named it ABCs for Financial Independence is because I literally broke it down by letters of the alphabet. B is for budget, D is for debt. P is for priorities, R is for research. I incorporated a little bit of an emotional piece to it because when you don't have money, there is an emotional piece to it. You get scared, you get stressed. When you do have money, it's it's different emotions. It's happiness, it's security. So I did you know, try to incorporate a little bit of that emotional piece in the book as well. Backtracking when you were at Unilever teaching about finance, is it that sort of thing where when you teach something, you have to learn it in order to teach it? 
Is that how you learned? So I know that personal finance is big subject for a lot of people. I mean, there's no one that I know that, you know, money doesn't affect in some way, shape or form. I've been on my own for a while. And so I've had to learn this. You hear people who are like, oh, well, I don't know much about my finances because my partner handles it. I didn't have that. So I needed to learn all this stuff. So having firsthand knowledge of this and knowing that so many people struggle with this subject, I felt that this was a good subject to kind of put out there. You already knew it. So that's why you said, okay, I'll teach it because I have a good grasp on it. Yeah. And because I felt it was a very useful subject. A lot of people say, oh, I wish they would have taught me this in school. Financial literacy isn't mandated as far as a course in some states. Connecticut is one of those states where it's not mandatory. So unless you have that background, you're probably going to learn by trial and error. Why let people learn by trial and error when I might have gone through an experience that might be helpful to them? Okay, so just so I know, what is your definition? I know this is a super basic question, but what is financial literacy? So financial literacy basically means you know how to take care of yourself in terms of your money, in terms of finance. It doesn't mean that you have to know about stocks and bonds. It doesn't mean that you have to know the difference between types of life insurance. These are all things that you can learn. The basics is really what I consider financial literacy. And when I say basics, I mean stuff like creating a budget, saving, having debt, that debt, if you have a hundred dollars debt, it's not really a hundred dollars. If you pay interest on it, how much is that debt really costing you? And if there are late fees, then that's, you know, interest plus late fees. So I'm talking about what you need to get through the day. If Jane Doe picks up your book, reads it by the end of it, she will be financially literate. Uh, I would hope but um, like all things, it takes practice. If somebody learns Spanish, I wouldn't send them to Spain and be like, okay, you're fluent now. It takes practice. And the good thing about the time and place that we're in now is the internet is such a big help as far as research. The one thing that I do caution people on is to use trusted sources. You have to do your research and you have to know that your sources are solid, good sources. The practice part of it that you mentioned to me, that's very important. With the amount of knowledge available, if you want to know how to trade stocks or how to create a budget, you can sort of within five minutes get five different versions of that. Generally, all five are roughly going to say the same thing. It's that practice piece that you then have to take action on that. That for me is the, is the hard part. So the other good part about my book is that I included at the end of every chapter something called a money movement plan. And it's just basically practice exercises to help you out. I included a, a budget template in the book, but I also tell people try, I don't want to call it an experimental budget, but try a budget that of what you think your numbers are and then do your separate budget of what your real numbers are, because usually that's pretty eye-opening. Usually you're not really close. You need to start with a budget. I think once you do that, eliminate that weight, get that weight off your shoulders because you've started. That's your starting point. Creating a budget, you have to know your numbers. You can't guess at it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be an accountant. If you're a dollar fifty off, who cares? But you at least have to be in the ballpark and start that process. My icebreaker to people when I meet young people I say, oh, do you have a Roth IRA? Yes. <laughs> it's just my yes. it's just my icebreaker. Sometimes people do. Sometimes people at least know what it is. Most of the time, people have no idea what it is. So of course, that gets the conversation rolling. And I say, oh, you should have one. Right. Like I encourage them to just immediately like open one. Even if you don't exactly know what it is, I'm asking you about it. There has to be some sort of reason for me asking. So it must be significant in some way. Like a really important thing people could do is, this, you know, as young as they are, is open a Roth IRA and start just start automating it or something. Maybe a Roth isn't right for you. Maybe a 401k is better. Maybe a, maybe there's other things. But start and make a budget. Know your numbers because you have to have something to respond to. You can't respond to zero. 
even if you don't understand exactly what you're doing, my <laughs> in inclination is to start. You have something going. You can respond as years go on and then say, oh, wait, maybe this isn't right for me. Maybe I did it wrong. But doing it wrong in my mind when you're talking about savings is better than not doing it at all. Absolutely. My chapter on why is is youth. You don't realize how much, you know, those few extra years can really benefit you. That's something I wish I knew sooner. I mean, yes, I started relatively young, but even a few more years, you know, that could have meant a little more for retirement or a little more for savings. We've done a whole episode on compound interest. Awesome. It's the same thing of when when you zoom in through a microscope and you get down to like the smallest organism that's in existence and then you go down to an atom and electron and and then you zoom out and you get to the solar system and the universe and you go big, big, big. Anytime I see that scalability, I'm always amazed by it. Mm -hmm. The same thing with compound interest. Once a year, I'll randomly read something about compound interest about this, you know, start with $5 a day at X years and you'll have you know, $100,000 without even trying by year 20. Or It's like once or twice a year I see that and it's just amazing. But yeah, youth is really, oh, so important. Yep, I totally agree. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. So now when you read, you begin with ABC. So when you learn about financial literacy, what do you start with? I go in terms of the alphabet. I do start with A, but in, in terms of starting your financial journey, I would start with B for your budget. Um, okay, so if you only had 10 minutes to impart all the knowledge from your book, what are maybe the three biggest takeaways? Um, if we're talking in terms of trying to get out of living paycheck to paycheck, start with your budget, define your goals. Do you want the big house in the suburbs or do you want maybe a smaller apartment and you're not going to stress yourself every month because you're living paycheck to paycheck? So you need to define your goals, what's important to you, not what's important to the Joneses, but what's important to you and figure out a way, make a plan to work towards those goals. Another one would be to prioritize. You may want that house in the suburbs and not to say that maybe someday you won't have it. So maybe for now you do live in that smaller apartment and not stress yourself out month to month and be able to save a little. And by the way, I do have savings as a line in the budget template in the book because I do think that that's so important. There's a statistic out there that probably a lot of people have heard that 69% of Americans don't have $1,000 savings account to cover an emergency. And that's a really scary figure. But if your car breaks down or your refrigerator goes or whatever it is, that money can go in the blink of an eye. Prioritizing, you know, it might mean instead of going out to dinner five times this month that maybe you have your friends over and do pop potluck for a couple of months until you can save. You know, substitutions is another. If you don't have enough to save, then maybe you have to grocery shop for generic stuff for a little bit until you can build a little bit. It's not forever, but you're going to have to prioritize what's important to you. So would you rather have a little more in your savings account or would you rather have that brand name paper towels? So, okay. So I just went to look up that that statistic you said, which was 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. That's from December 2019. It came from Go Banking Rates. So the other thing to remember is that even though it came from 2019, the pand pandemic happened after that and a lot of people lost their jobs. So I wonder how much that statistic has changed and if it's changed for the better or the worse. Yeah, because that was pre-pandemic. And then, it, and, and the way they got their data is they just pulled a bunch of Americans. And that was the rate that said they don't have a thousand dollars. They did it in 2018 as well, and at that point it was 58 percent didn't have a thousand dollars in savings. But here's another thing with that stat: 45 percent said they have zero in savings. 45 percent. That's wild. And if you look up statistics for how much people have in retirement, I think it's an even scarier number. So you had said. If you had 10 minutes to give somebody the information from your book, you would say budget, make goals, make a plan, and prioritize. Do those four things correspond to a letter? Uh, the B is for budget, G is for goals, P is for prioritize. And is make a plan prioritize as well? Make a plan is kind of in there, but it's not 
a letter on its own. So I feel like you've explained why making a budget is important. I sort of think it's because it gives you it gives you an idea of where you are. Yeah. Yes. K is for know your numbers. One of my favorite sayings is numbers don't lie. It's black and white. If your bank account, if your checking account says you have $100 in there, that is a fact. You can't dispute it. It is what it is. Once you know what you're working with, you can figure out how to tackle it. Do you maybe get a side gig for a while? Do you cut expenses? Do you do both? But you have to know your starting point. You have to figure out maybe where you want to go. I mean, you're not going to know everything. You're not going to know where you're going to be in five years, 10 years, maybe. At least have that plan so you can have your starting point. Goals is one that I struggle with a lot. I think this is a therapist is what I need for the goals. But I find it wildly difficult to put down goals. Like, do you, str- do you struggle with this? <laughs> I don't, but you got to remember, I'm being 50 now. A lot of my financial goals have kind of been established and sometimes met. You got to remember, you're just talking about financial goals. Do you plan to move? Because housing is the biggest thing that you spend your money on. Being in the city, you probably don't have a car, but you have to factor in money for transportation. So do you see yourself staying in the city? Do you maybe want to move out to the suburbs one day? If you do, it's not going to happen just by blinking your eyes. You have to to make a plan and figure out how you're going to get there. And you know what? Even if you don't end up moving to the suburbs and you think you want to today, but 10 years from now, you're like, yeah, that sounded better than I I think it, I really, you know, I just changed my mind. Then you have that money. That money gives you flexibility. So now you're not stuck saying, I can't move to the suburbs. Now you have that flexibility to say, I can move there if I want, but it's my choice. And then goals. So how is, how is planning different than goals? So goals, actually, there's um, something in there that's it's a common phrase called SMART goals. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable. I can't remember the rest of it right now, but basically that's your plan. Say you're a high school student working a part-time job, working minimum wage, and you want a car, having a part-time minimum wage job, realistically, you're not going to go out and buy a brand new Porsche. You're probably more likely to buy like a used car. So you define what you want and you kind of have to view it in realistic terms. I would love a house on the beach, but that's probably not going to (laughs) happen. So you know, you kind of have to adjust your perspective. You were just talking about retirement a minute ago. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm never going to retire. That's great in theory, but when you get older, there are also potential health issues, then that might not be an option. The thing that savings gives you and that extra money gives you is flexibility. You might want to work forever, but do you know anyone who spent their last day in the office? Like, I don't. As much as people say, well, I'm going to work forever, you're probably not. If you don't want to, if you have that money set aside, then you don't have to. At least you have that option. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves is when people say they're not going to retire. Because in the arts, I've had conversations with many people who do say that. And, you know, artists don't retire because that's just not how they do. But you still have to plan for it because sometimes you're forced into retirement. So at some point, I mean, at some point you're going to have to. So I do not accept the answer when people say that they're just going to work until they die, which I think is a fine thing. I, I don't think I think everybody wants to have purpose and wants to work and be productive and do things and make action. So I'm all for that. But but you want to have the option to do it or not to do it. Yeah. And if you don't have the option, if you break both your legs and you're not able to do something, mm-hmm. you you need to take care of yourself, your future self Absolutely. <laughs> with two broken legs. You need to be financially independent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> OK, so I looked up the SMART goal. So it is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. Right. If you want to buy a brand new car, Most likely, you're not going to buy a brand new car on a minimum wage job in like a year. But if you buy a used car, that might be a little more realistic. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Yeah, that's my problem. The achievable and realistic are two things I'm not doing. 
And I think the realistic part gets a lot of people because we all like to dream and look, I'm not here to squash anyone's dream, but let's start with the basics and then we'll dream a little bigger. Okay. So the prioritizing, you've talked about that a little bit. Is savings prioritizing? Like to me, it's always save and invest. That's the priority. Am I wrong? (laughs) When I think prioritizing, I think daily stuff. You know, maybe I want to go out to dinner and hang out with my friends. Do I need to go out to dinner five times a week? No, because it's going to be really costly and expensive. The point really is hanging out with my friends. Priority isn't so much where I, I eat out with them or where I eat with them. It's more spending time with them. You can do stuff, go for a walk or to a park. The priority is not so much about the money. It's about the time. So you're basically just substituting how you spend your money based on your financial situation. If you have money to go out to dinner five days a week, then, you know, go for it. But if you don't have it in your budget, then yes, you you need to think about that because that does add up. Okay, so after we read your book, where do we go? What would be a good thing for people to be doing when they read your book and then say, okay, I'm going to get on this. I'm going to make my financial life really good. (laughs) What would be good action for people to take after reading your book? So after you have made your budget and kind of made it your own and, and adjusted it to what suits your needs, you know, make sure that your savings, because that saving is important. That's a line item in the budget. Make sure you're putting away for retirement. One thing I would stress to people learn about investments. You don't have to be a guru. I'm talking about you can go to Vanguard or Fidelity and open up a mutual fund so somebody can manage it for you, but at least you are investing and taking that step because without investing, I mean, hopefully you'd be able to still meet your monthly goals, but that investing piece of it is really going to help you with those long-term goals. Yeah, I know. It, so much boils down to savings and investing. And I think one of the things in investing, when you open up a mutual fund with anybody, do you know how they make their money? Are they working on commission? Is there a fee? There's something called an expense ratio. If your mutual fund has a lower expense ratio, less money is going to that company that manages that fund. If that mutual fund has a higher ratio, then you're spending more money to whoever is managing that fund. Yeah. And so I'm 33. You're the big 5 Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but it's funny because mutual fund to me, I would never think about getting a mutual fund. I would automatically just do an index fund. And expense ratio, of course, I would look at. Chances are I would go with Vanguard which is just automatically low. Schwab is also very low. The trend now is to be very low. A mutual fund I wouldn't even think about, except for like in a pension plan or a 401k where I'm limited in my choices. I wouldn't necessarily say that you're limited in your choices. I know Vanguard has a great variety of mutual funds. They're always making top lists of like highly rated mutual funds. I tend to gravitate towards things that have dividends if you reinvest your dividends, even if the value of that fund is lower, you're just reinvesting more. You're buying more shares into that fund. Do you know the term drip? I've heard of it. I can't say what it is offhand. I just learned this term. It's when you automatically reinvest your dividends. Dividend reinvestment plan. What's the I? <laughs> Hang on. I'm going to look this up. <laughs> Like on Robinhood, I, I, in there, they have something to say drip. And I was like, what is drip? And then you click drip and it's it. what it does is it then automatically takes any dividend and reinvests it. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term dollar cost averaging, but I talk about it a little bit in the book. You know, if you have a stock that's $10, but it pays dividends and maybe next year it's $8. Well, that just means those dividends are going to buy more shares of your investment. And then if it goes back up, now you have more shares at a higher price. I always think that reinvesting is a good decision. It's just my opinion. I listen to an amazing podcast called Earn Your Leisure. It's literally the best podcast in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Bar none. Besides artistic finance. Whoa, whoa. Settle down, everyone. After artistic (laughs) finance, it's the best (laughs) podcast in the world. But they had a guest on talking about how he dividend invests. And he explained and he said, okay, so my phone bell is... $45 a month. I 
buy T-Mobile or some stock that gives a dividend, that's a telephone stock, I buy it until I have enough that I get what averages out to $45 a month in income every year. And then once I've done that, I then go and I give my electric bill is $150 a month. I buy into a utility until I'm getting $150 a month in dividends. I just listened to that episode where he was explaining this. And I thought that is so brilliant because they say like, imagine yourself in 30 years, think of your savings that way, that if you think of yourself in 30 years, you're going to now automatically put more away for yourself because you're imagining that's a vivid sort of vision. Yeah. The dividend investing is so brilliant to me. It applies to you, to reality, to tangible things, to your life in a very concrete way. I just think it's like mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think of dividends like interest. So even if that stock does go lower, you're still getting money from it. Okay, so I looked up DRIP. So DRIP stands for Dividend Reinvestment Plan. The reinvestment is the R-I, reinvestment. I like that term, okay. Yeah, so DRIP, so DRIP. All the cool kids are saying DRIP these days. Hey, are you DRIP? Are you DRIP? <laughs> you have a Roth IRA and you DRIP? Yeah, man, <laughs> great. Okay, so what gives you the credence to write this book on the ABCs for financial independence? Are you a millionaire? I paid off my mortgage in a matter of years, less than five years. I think that gives me a little bit of credence, I would hope. Okay, so she paid off a mortgage in five years. Because this is about financial independence, are you financially independent? Yes, I'm on my own. So if there is an income in my house, there is a 100% income. If I'm not working, there is zero income. I am very aware of that fact, the fact that I need to be financially independent. It gives me a peaceful sleep at night. <laughs> Can you define financial independence? Being able to take care of yourself financially. Um, it doesn't mean you have to be rich. It doesn't mean that you have to know every step that you're going to make in the next 5, 10, 20 years. You at least have to be on top of it, know your numbers and plan for the future you know, give yourself options. You may or may not want to retire in 5, 10, 20 years. But if you have the option, it's going to be a lot better than, oh my God, I have to work for the next 20 years. I have to ask this question since you reached the big 5-0. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to retire at what age? I would hope in less than 10 years. Do you have a plan? I do. Is it a smart plan? I would hope so. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> okay. By smart, I mean specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Yes. <laughs> what is your specific plan? No, I'm kidding. You don't have to go into it. <laughs> it involves dividends. <laughs> ah, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, we just had two episodes with a financial advisor talking about, do we need a financial advisor? Who needs a financial advisor? Who doesn't? But a big sticking point with that conversation was the goals of like setting your goals. What do you know? You know, what do you need? Because a financial advisor can help you achieve those goals, but you also can help yourself achieve those goals. I'm just curious. Do you have a financial advisor? I don't, but I also have this thing in my mind where will that financial advisor charge me on commission? If they have skin in the game, if there's something in it for them, that makes me a little wary. Not to say that everybody does, not to say that there aren't good financial advisors out there, but I feel better kind of controlling my own situation. In the conversation, something that never dawned on me that now there's people playing around with subscription models for advisors. Really? Rather than them taking a percentage of assets under management, they get paid like $500 a month and they manage your finances. I would feel better being the consumer in that situation, because then that would mean, you know, it's it's not he's going to make 10 percent off of whatever he tells me to do. I mean, I, I, I sort of I mean, I just made up five hundred dollars a month as an example. Let's say five hundred a year. Right. <laughs> I was interested mm -hmm. by that because I I like that. I sort of like that idea of it's a it's something you can budget in. It's a it's a fixed expense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's also in the book. Yeah, no, I mean we've we've had people on a uh, financial advisor. That's a mm -hmm. sticking point in a way. We've had some people who I would say are very good with money who are adamantly against 
financial advisors. And then I have other people who, you know, because, and it makes sense because we're an artist community. There's a lot of artists that want nothing to do with money. And so it's like, oh, somebody's managing that. It's not just artists. A lot of people, I think, carry a little bit of fear when it comes to this subject. It, it can be a scary subject. Like who wants to deal with the responsibility of being an adult? So sometimes you just want to kind of outsource it and let somebody handle it. When I was talking very early on in the podcast about trying to incorporate emotional stuff, C is for care. The reason why I listed that as the primary word for C is because no one will care as much about your finances as you will. If you lose a job, I might feel bad for you, but I'm not going to lose sleep at night. Sorry, Ethan, I, I just, I don't see it. But if you lose your job, it's affecting you personally, it's going to stress you out. So that's why I say no one will care as much as you will. So that's why I kind of have more of a take charge attitude. To me, I'd rather oversee something that important that affects everyday life. All right, we're going to head to the wrap up here. But before we do, is there anything about your book that you want to say that we haven't talked about? You can find it on Amazon in print and ebook version. Uh, I also do have an audible version. I feel like readers will probably get more in the written format. Now, I like to get books and read them before bed to sort of put myself to sleep. Is this a good book for that? So being an East Coast girl, I don't know if you feel this way being on the East Coast. I'm kind of a get to it, get to the point kind of person. It's a quick, easy read, but hits the points you really need to know about. Amazing thing about library apps. So I have the New York Public Library app. Specifically, I have one called Libby that downloads digital books to your phone that you rent from the library. They will tell you, you've spent three hours on this book. You have eight hours to go. It's really cool. Well, in the audiobook version, they because it's recorded, they tell you the length of it, less than a couple hours. Okay, because I'm a slow reader. So <laughs> <laughs> they say, this book will take you 10 hours. And then the, the app will tell me, it's going to take you 15 hours. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, I love the digital age. I do the, the library here to the digital library. It's great to rent books and not have them physically pile up. Yeah, I know. I currently rented a physical book because I'm going to want to have the author on the podcast. I've, I've already been overdue twice. It's like this stupid real book. <laughs> so here's a financial tip for today. If you borrow a book from the library, return it on time so that you do not have to pay a late fee. <laughs> You're welcome. That is a very good tip. <laughs> I will say on my audio book, the person who read it, she's, she's not Mindy Kaling, but she does sound like her and I adore Mindy Kaling. So I just love that she sounds like Mindy Kaling. <laughs> okay, I'm, you know, this isn't me. This isn't me. This is just people I know find Mindy Kaling's voice super annoying. Really? Some people might be turned off by that. I'm just saying. Oh, no. Okay, well, then the physical <laughs> book will have to do. <laughs> Amazing. Mindy Kaling plays <laughs> Kelly Kapoor on The Office, in case anyone wants to know. All right, so wrapping up here. What advice, Lisa, would you give yourself back when you started building your financial independence path? Um, to invest earlier. I think the earlier, the better. Like you were saying, you know, with the Roth IRA, we didn't have those back then, but I'm a big fan of the Roth IRA as well. I would say learn about investing and start investing as early as you can. Okay. You did that to yourself when you said we didn't have those back then. I know. I did not say that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and just for the record, the Roth IRA was introduced as part of the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997. Oh, it did not exist before 1997. <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> we don't want to talk about inception dates. <laughs> so, but anyway, but any, everybody should have one, it's my opinion. Yes. Okay, is there a book or resource that you can recommend that helped you when you started your path to financial freedom? You know, it's not so much books. I tend to gravitate more to stuff like bankrate.com, mint.com, nerd wallet. That stuff has up-to-date resources. They always have good information. Like I know I go to bankrate a lot. If you have a mortgage or any kind of debt, you can pull up an amortization chart. I got a huge shock when I sat in my real estate person's office signing the paperwork of this is how much money you're going to be spending on your, your home. To look at the amortization chart, I got a lesson right then and there. Let's say your mortgage is $1,000. That $1,000 mortgage is a sliding scale. 
So maybe $100 goes towards principal and $900 goes towards interest. And then the next payment, like $102 goes towards principal and the rest goes towards interest. And the later you get, the more goes towards principal. Definitely stuff like that. Those are big things that if you know about those things sooner, it's helpful. Amortization, that's that same compound interest situation where it's like once a year, I'll see an amortization chart where how much you're paying in interest or something. And it just blows my mind every time, even though I know. Absolutely. But speaking of amortization, this is a great segue into my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash artistic finance, because you can pay $3 a month to be a patron and there's no amortization schedule. It's just $3, no interest. So it's really quite the deal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very nice segue. <laughs> okay, so Lisa, where can people find out more about you? I have an Instagram account called ABCs for Financial Independence. I don't post a lot on it, but there is some tips, sayings, and things like that. So eventually I'll, I'll get back to that. But right now I'm studying for that supply chain certification. So that's kind of been on the back burner for a little bit. Okay. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for sort of sharing all your knowledge and your opinions and your thoughts and all your expertise and taking the time to chat. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ethan. Nice speaking with you. That's it for this week's episode. My takeaways are start saving early and be consistent. If you didn't start early, you can still be consistent. So start saving early and be consistent. This show is free and that's intentional. But we do have overhead costs and we give back to a community of Patreon artists. If you would like to help, join us at patreon.com slash artistic finance. You get a private podcast feed to the show that includes outtakes and early releases. Levels are as low as $3 a month. There's no long-term commitment and you can stop at any time. In addition to A Christmas Carol winning five Tony Awards this week, Artistic Finance also got its 22nd patron, and patrons are worth more to me than a Tony Award. I value you a thousand times more than a Tony Award. As always, if you're not ready to be a patron but want the outtakes to a specific show, email me at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com and I'll share them with you directly at no cost. If you have any questions or suggestions for episode topics or guests, you can also email me at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com. The final thing before we end the episode. If you'll be in New York City this weekend and want to see some live theater, come see the 90-minute comedy Merry Murder F. It's the perfect off-Broadway experience to get you back into live theater. The audience reaction at opening night was more than we ever hoped, and everyone who has worked on a show knows that when you're working on a show and you've rehearsed it a hundred times, you get too close to the show to know if it's good or bad. You don't know until the audience attends and reacts. After opening, one of our lead actors, Ronnie Dutra, gave me a big hug and with a big smile on his face said, it turns out it's really good. So come see our really good show running until October 3rd. If you want to see me, I'll be there on October 3rd and would love to see you too. The acting and directing are, of course, amazing, but as the lighting designer, I'd be remiss not to mention the amazing sound design of Sean Haggerty and the incredible production management of Ellie Handel and Sarah Hodgewood. And to answer the question of one of my patrons who asked if I was getting paid to promote the show, no, I just really like it, and you will too. Find a link to tickets in our show notes or at artisticfinance.com. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. And until next week, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.